You're watching convention coverage on site. You know, Thomas, you know, big Tarzan fan. So we, we've all seen Tarzan. <laughs> so we got to go like this. You know? <laughs> yeah. All right, you got and, it. And, and, and get the yell out, too. You know, get the Tarzan yell. Really get going here. So, <clears throat> I, I mean, I'm waiting for it. You know, uh, Steve, you know, over on the far side, can, I mean, can you do the Tarzan yell? Well, the I've, yell? I've never tried it, to be honest, but... I'm yeah. not sure I want to hear Did that. Johnny Weissmuller uh, swing He didn't even trees. do the Tarzan yell. Well, I, I, I don't know who it really did it. sound but. mix. He yes. did it in the later movies. When he oh, really? Switched from MGM to, to RKO. They didn't buy the, 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 the yell, and he could do it himself. In fact, wow. he did it in a... At a swimming award ceremony in Sacramento for Mark Spitz, he was in the balcony. He <clears throat> was a guest in the middle of the ceremony. So many people were egging him on. He let trip in, the, in this memorial. Wow! Afternoon. He would do it all the time. People just asked him to do it, and he would just do it. Well, he was an old man, and he and he had Alzheimer's, or whatever. And right. He was in a hospital, he'd run out into the lawn, climb up in the trees. That's the, the old garden, story, yeah. That he. Which I love that he. The did old that. Never act, lost the whole that the Tarzan spirit. Yeah. The old actor's home. Yeah, right, right. Running Where around, was, yeah. playing Tarzan. That's amazing. <laughs> what, what was that like, you know, um, you know, Thomas, for you? Um, you know, you grew up reading Tarzan, you were such a fan, and then actually being able to live out your dream. Well, you know, it was, <laughs> it was um, interesting because... You know, we're telling all these stories, not on, but nonetheless. So. <laughs> it's not going yet? We haven't started it yet? Oh, no, we're not, yeah. Are we? Oh. All right. So um, we should probably also introduce ourselves. Yeah, you et cetera, want to et yeah. introduce us? Yeah. So, yeah, we, Did we, you really want a Tarzan call? I, I really want to. I don't know. I really want to <clears> wow. I, know if, I don't think I can do it. I'm not quite up for it. We'll let Tom do it. I can do, do the it. beating yeah. of the chest. Tom, Tom's the Tarzan. Maybe Dan wants to. Wow, but I, I know what I, I just, I know what I can't do the yell, but I can do something else. <laughs> oh! Holy cats. I would do that as a, as a kid down at the river on the rope swing. You got a hell of a singing voice. <laughs> that was downright operatic. Yeah. I mean, you, you didn't pound the chest, though, so. That's, yeah. Okay. Then, then give it a yell. Well, he's not going to do it again, is he? That, I, that was beautiful. No, I don't think we need a second take. That was, that was masterful. That was excellent. Seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Ungawa. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, I just want to, you know, welcome you here to, you know, Stockton Con, you know, and, and, and we're talking comics for, you know, about, you know, a half hour, just to, you know, talk about, you know, your careers, obviously, you guys have done, uh, you know, comics back from, you know, the, you know, the Since old time so, immemorial. Yes. But, you know, um, you know, Thomas, talk a little bit about, okay, you know, so that, that, that part, you know. Well, well the Tarzan and, and comics for me, uh, I... I just I'd seen the, the movies as a kid and I and I just loved the idea and I was kind of an outsider kid in some ways and the idea of just running away and living in the jungle with the animals and Jane just when sure. I was a, when and I was a Jane. little kid I didn't really care about Jane but it just <laughs> I wanted to escape you know I just loved that escape because it was so different and so crazy the whole concept in those old movies and then I saw some Tarzan books and I realized there was a whole lot more to this guy than just those movies and uh, first book I got was Tarzan at the Earth's Core with a Frank Frazetta cover and I was too young to read a, no a paperback I was like eight or, or something years old but my mom bought it for me because her wayward son was interested in a book she was not interested <laughs> in a book at all and I was a terrible student, and uh, I had that book, and I would just stare at it. And that Frank Rosetta cover of Tarzan at the Earth's Core was just so wild. I'd never seen art quite like that, or a, you know, a, a hero, a muscular hero with long, wild hair, you know, falling off a cliff in his action pose and everything. And that kind of zapped me. I was already drawing Tarzan from the movies, and I saw that. And then I visited a cousin of mine who turned me onto the Burroughs fan scenes. And that whole world, he, uh, Bernie Wrightson and Wallace Wood and Al Williamson and Reed Crandall and Crankle and all that stuff. So that got me into the drawing. 
And then later when I became a professional and I met, I met Joe Kubert and went to his school and Joe Kubert and I bonded in part because we were both into Tarzan. And he got me to go to the first uh, year of his school. But when I got out, I wasn't quite up to snuff to get that <laughs> gig. You know, John Buscema was doing it at Marvel by the time I got into the business. And I just didn't have, I just wasn't a Marvel guy, you know. And then that got canceled and there wasn't a Tarzan comic. So I got started doing Swamp Thing and other stuff. Um, the, they gave me Swamp Thing in part because I was into drawing jungles, but then none of the scroll, swamp, all the Swamp Thing scripts, he was in a car, he was in an airplane, he's on an ocean liner, he's in the hospital, he was never in the swamp. He's like a community and, activist, and, and my, Swamp in my, Thing. In my, in my run. And uh, my friends always tease me about that. But I did get the chance to do it later, like 10 years later, when I was sort of burned out on the whole industry, then it comes along. It's like, oh boy, I gotta go back into the gunfight, you know, because I can't turn this down. And it was quite a thrill and quite an honor to get to do it, it, it was. And the Burroughs fans loved my stuff. It didn't sell very good, but the Burroughs fans <laughs> loved it and it kind of endeared me into the, the people who were into that kind of stuff all liked it. So that was cool, and I then got to do a few more Darjean comics. I just off and on have done, and I illustrated John Carter of Mars. I illustrated the first three John Carter of Mars novels in book form, and uh, just now, coming out this summer, I returned to the jungle, put the loincloth back on, and climbed up, dyed my hair black, and climbed up into the trees, and got a studio tan, and did it again for Gru, meets Tarzan with Sergio Aragones and I wow. collaborating. It's a mashup and it was real fun. And, and it took me forever because my main job for the last nine years has been Prince Valiant, which takes a lot of time. And that I didn't really have any more bandwidth when I've been doing Prince Valiant to do anything else. So it took me forever to get my part of that Gru meets Tarzan finished. But I finished it a year ago and, and they're just now releasing it. So there you go. Tom, I have to tell you, it's really interesting listening to you talk about how as a kid you wanted to live in the jungle. And it's fascinating to hear you, you talk about how as a kid... Oh, we can hear you. Oh, okay, thank you. You wanted to live in the jungle and swing through vines and be Tarzan uh, because when I was a kid, I wanted to live in the jungle and swing through vines, <laughs> but I wanted to be Sheena, queen of the jungle. Oh, sure, yeah. And I loved Sheena. You know, and many, many years later, in fact, last year, uh, Susan Stern, who was married to Spain Rodriguez, uh, his widow, she was filming a, a movie about Spain, and she interviewed me, and I mentioned how I loved Sheena, Queen of the Jungle, and she said, oh, that's interesting, because both Spain and uh, Victor Moscoso said that when they were kids, they liked to draw her naked. Did you like to draw her I was, I was so indignant. I was furious at them. I said, no, of course I didn't want her to draw her. I wanted to be her. Oh, God. <laughs> well, I, I, those fiction house covers are so well composed, and it's always a long limb. Yes, yes, gal is, yes, is and she's bit. always at an angle. Yeah, yeah. Always the angle. Yeah, really strong, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great compositions. <laughs> Yes. You know, talk, talk a little bit about that back in the, in the 60s, Haight-Ashbury and all well, that. Well, I wasn't living in the Haight-Ashbury in the 60s. I was in the Lower East Side in New York. Um, so I missed the famous Summer of Love, but we had our own Summer of Love in New York. Um, but for me, it wasn't about being risque. I mean, it's, it was about, it was about, I'm, okay, I really loved comics, but I could not relate to Marvel, which everyone adored. And I, I liked Marvel too, but I couldn't relate to them. I mean, the guys all had short hair. Everyone was very straight. Um, and that wasn't the my life. the guys who worked at Marvel. The guys who worked at Marvel and the guys in the comic books. Yes. You know, they were very straight. And, and I was counterculture. So what um, underground comics were for me, it was about comics about the counterculture, not about the guys with straight 
with, with short hair and muscles, you know? And that was what I drew. I drew comics about the counterculture. It didn't have to be about open, you know, that's, that's the cliche. And all too many guys, you know, really, really the worst of the underground cartoonists did comics about open sex because they thought that was what they were supposed to be about, you know? And, and they weren't any good. No, and, and you know, uh, talk, talking about it and reading about your career, you know, you you read, you see the, you know, oh, it has to be, you know, sexual. Or, you know, and, you know, one thing I read about you was, you know, you you had the first, you know, le lesbian cop, mm -hmm. and it, it was. But it wasn't sexual. Exactly. It wasn't sexual. You know, it was about my roommate Sandy coming out as a lesbian. And that was a completely different time, you know, back then. And when I did that comic, I wasn't thinking, oh, the first comic about an out lesbian. I wasn't thinking in those terms. I was thinking, I want to tell Sandy's story. Mm. What, and, and, and for all of you on, on the panel, what, what makes that, that great story? You want to... Somebody uh, else come up with that. So I, what, I'll take so a stab at it. What, what yeah. What makes that great story? I don't story? know what yeah, makes a great story, either. except that it's something that you you feel compelled to spend a lot of time telling, and you know, for it, it can be very personal for you. And it doesn't necessarily mean the greatest stories are personal stories, but they tend to be. I think you know. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I feel like you. You spend so much time in indulging yourself when you're younger in comic books because, like Tom said, you're trying to escape. And then you spend all this time drawing the stuff that's fun to draw. And then they give you this job. Okay, now we want you to draw it for real. And they don't always care if there's some burning story behind it. And you don't even, like I personally didn't think about that stuff in the beginning. But then it starts to creep in. And you start asking yourself, what, am, what, what, what story am I trying to tell? What am I trying to say with the work? And really, I think the best thing you can do is just listen to that inner voice, and it, it will come out. But then there's people who, like you know, like Trina was saying, like I wanted to tell my friend's story because it was just so important to me, and also it was, it meant a lot to you, obviously. And it was a good story. Yeah. Thank you. And it was an interesting story. I think yeah. my question that would lead to maybe answering it is like, what was it about what was going on that you felt that, that you knew you were going to sit down, and you were going to tell it, you were going to you were going to put the time in making it. You know, what was it that, that pushed you to do it, rather than just thinking about it? You know, what, what was that, that impetus? Well, that's the difference between artists in any field, not just art, but writing, singing, dancing, all of it, composing, um, is that rather than thinking, gee, that would be a good story, we do it. We do the story. Right. Yeah. Right. right. And hopefully it, it, it's good, so. <laughs> yeah, and you pull it off. <laughs> and, and yeah. Steve, and Steve, do you, do you use? I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I researched that you you're, you're originally from Hawaii. Oh, are you you have, you, you have Hawaiian origins? Um, do you use you know what what you know comes from the islands? You know, in your work, do you, do you kind of feel you know? I mean, obviously you have the Hawaiian shirt. You know, it's hard hard to say how how that that works into. Uh, the kind of work I do, I don't know. I, I actually, I was born and raised in San Francisco. My dad was from Hawaii, but uh, I don't know. I, I don't know culturally. It it did it has led to my interest in in like world mythology and all the mythological elements. It's it's one of my favorite interests, and one of the reasons why one of the books I've worked on. Uh, like for the last 20 years was is, has been fables at DC Comics. Um, in fact, we're still working. There's there's a, a new series of fable stories in the works. It's due to come out sometime next year. Um, it's a multicultural. Thing. Yes, multicultural. Uh, I mean, Bill Willingham is the writer. Mark Buckingham is is the penciler. I'm the inker on it, and uh, Bill draws from all sorts of uh, backgrounds and cultures and um, I don't know. Well, what drew so. you to mythology? What, 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 what about it, you know, really, you know? 
Well, like they were saying, as a kid, I was always interested in mythology. I don't know why. Um, at, at, as a kid, I discovered the Burroughs books, mainly by way of the Frazetta covers, I must admit. <laughs> um, and just, I, I was a science fiction fan from, from a very early age. I mean, as a kid in the 50s, I, you know, uh, my dad liked to read all of that stuff, and, and you know, he, he actually is the one that got me interested in reading comics and reading science fiction and all of this stuff. So uh, it's always, always been an interest, and I'm just lucky enough to have been able to do it professionally. So. And, you know, about um, in regards to, I mean, and, and Trina, I think you, your work, you know, speaks to it specifically a lot of times, is, you know, you respond to culture. You respond to what's going on in the world. And it's, not, it's you know, you take, you know, a, a, you know, a good versus evil, but it's also an ethics, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the ethics of the character mm -hmm. that, that you're actually, you know, yeah. creating and, you know, putting out to the fan. Maybe talk a little bit about that of um, when you're creating, you, you, you're kind of thinking that in the back of your mind. Um, when I'm doing stories uh, for myself, um, I find that there's that the elements of my life and the things that are important to me come come through pretty naturally. I don't really have to try, but I but I over the years of doing um, <clears throat> say the Nocturnals, which is my personal book that I've been doing over the years. Oh, you can't hear me. Oh, now we can. So over the years of doing Nocturnals, uh, which is you know sort of a personal story for me, there, the things that come forward are like a uh, father daughter relationship, being a parent, family. Uh, close bonds with people, um, the ambiguity of morality, and not in like a you know in a necessarily a dark way, but how you know I did a story once where the characters go and basically exterminate some really horrible people, and the father character who's the head of the story he he brings his daughter along, and the reason he brings her along is because he kind of wants her to see what sometimes they have to do and for what they consider to be the good. And it's not to traumatize her, but it's because he doesn't want her to do what he does. And so to kind of show her the, the sort of uglier side of it and then say, I want you to go off and be your own person and go to school and, and have some other life. And I will kill all the monsters. And you can do something else with your life. And no one batted an eyelash or said anything about it when that story. It's not like I have you know, millions of readers, but people who were fans never came over and said, that was really harsh what you did. And I was like, how come no one noticed that? And I think sometimes people read this stuff and they go, ooh, monsters and this, and it's colorful and there's things happening, but I really do care about these characters. You know, they run around in my head all the time. And I don't sit down and have these sort of conferences with myself about, you know, what important thing's gonna happen this time. It just sort of flows out. I know that, like, there's the, main, the other main character, which is the little girl character, Eve. She has grown up without her mom, and I, and I know that eventually she's going to reunite with her mother and that the whole point of what happened to her mother and why she's not around is going to be dealt with and that to me is that that has become the main pinnacle of of all the arcs and where it's all leading for me and it took me a while to kind of really concretely realize that but i kind of in the back of my mind it kept coming back to that over and over again where's the mom where's the mom it's like in the disney movies there's always one parent missing in the stories <laughs> And they never talk about it. And you always go, where, where is the dad? Where's the mom? Like in the Toy Stories movies, where's Andy's dad? You know, they can't even tell you that, that Woody was Andy's dad's toy, which he probably was. I mean, that. Because it was an old toy. They leave it open. The cowboy. Yeah. <coughs> they leave it open. Yeah. Well, they've 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 made a lot. They've made a lot of uh, you know references, and they've given you clues, but they don't come out and tell you. And I think it's because they want you to fill in the blanks yourself. But uh, I feel like, you know, I've come to this point where these characters have a personal meaning to me and I care about them. And it's, it's one thing, like, when I create a villain sometimes or a kind of a rogue character who's supposed to be a villain, I end up getting to the, I, I just did this one, one, a few years ago I did one where there was this one really kind of misunderstood character. He was kind of the villain of the story. He'd been locked up for years in a basement in his father's mansion because he was a, like a monster kid. And when he got out, he wanted to wreak havoc and get revenge. And I felt bad for him, even though he was, you know, he was kind of a bitch. I felt bad for him, and I couldn't kill him. I was like, I can't, I, don't, I can't kill this guy at the end. It's not right. So that moral thing comes into play for me. 
Um, and if I like, if I end up liking someone who's a villain too much, I don't want to just slaughter him. I can't do the Robert Kirkman thing. I just, you know, maybe that makes me weak. <laughs> I don't know, but I just, I, I care too much about these characters, and I, and you know, maybe that's part of reading comics, and where like, you know, nothing really horrible happens to the brave, characters. Not weak. You're brave. Well, I mean, well, I, I guess I care about them enough to just want to know more about do them. what the public want you to do. But see, that's the thing. The public now wants you to kill everybody off. But when we were reading comics, and which is the thing that really pushed us, and novels, when you're reading these serialized novels and comics, you want to follow the adventures of the character. Like, for instance, with Walking Dead, the thing that really frustrates me is I, the story of The Walking Dead is these are the survivors. We're following their story because they make it. Except they don't. <laughs> it's yes. like, well, why am I following your story just to watch you get your head bashed in in issue 100? I was like, I, 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 if I wanted to see the story about the losers and the people who aren't going to make it, why would I be interested in that? It's a whole different kind of storytelling. And it seems that people love it. Like Game of Thrones, who's going to die next? I don't necessarily want to see anyone die. I want to see them go on and, and realize a sort of a destiny rather than just become a victim. So I don't know what that I means. I actually think that that the characters we create, and, and I mean we create, I'm not talking about Spider-Man or mm -hmm. the Hulk, because we didn't create those, but the characters we create are really us. You yeah. know, in all forms, the bad and the good. Yeah. And that certainly would be a good reason why we don't want to kill them. Right. It's like when you have a dream, they say that everything and every person in the dream is really a facet of you. Yeah. And so, yeah, so, I, so, you know, if you have like seven characters in the story, there's facets of you in each one. And maybe some are aspirational, and maybe some are contrary to what you might think for yourself, they might, they're, they're showing parts of you that maybe you're not that proud of, or the, you know, the less uh, noble parts of you. And you're exploring those kinds of things. And I think that's pretty fascinating. You know? And the people in the art and the writers who are in storytellers who are in tune with that can really dig deep down and pull stuff out. And that's where great stories come from sometimes, you know. Well, for, totally. For, for <laughs> me, that's a lot of the draw because I live in a real life and, and I read the newspaper and I, you know, see the, the homeless and, and the police brutality and the whatever. All that dark stuff is, is in our lives. Yeah. So when I'm going to read in comics, I don't, <coughs> don't want to wallow in that. I often want to yeah. escape, you yeah. know, from that to take a break from it all because it surrounds us. We're in this yeah. world, you know, we destabilize the atmosphere, you know, there's no more parameters to what the weather are going to do, you know, I mean, it's, there's a lot of hairy stuff out there and it's, you need a break from it, you know. I think when you grow up um, getting into escapism, as I did from seven or eight years old, that is your, that is your refuge. You know, and uh, whether it's dealing with bullies in school or the, yeah. the, the, the pressures of adolescence or whatever it is. And, and now as an adult and all the things we have to deal with, there has to be an oasis. And for us to be able to do, and not, that's not everyone's story. There's plenty of people like James O'Barr, if he was standing up here, the creator of The Crow, he would tell you that The Crow was created from a place of deep personal pain. It's not a fun and games thing for him, that stuff. Right, right. You know, it's completely different from, from where I'm coming from. Yeah. Any of the stuff that's uncomfortable or weird in my life, not weird, but like just the uncomfortable or, uh, or um, less positive aspects of my life will come through in the stories, but in a different way. Where him, he's just, he just put it down. He lost a girlfriend, not to violent crime, but he lost a girlfriend. It devastated him, and so he told this story. It was like a love letter to her, and, um, which is beautiful. And that's what you want, and that's why it's so enduring to, for yeah. people. People love that story. They love those characters so much. But it's not a fun and games thing for him. So I don't know if is he escaping something when he does that, or is he getting it out? You know, I think it depends on also where we're coming from. Is what are we trying to get out, and what are we trying to? I, you know, Dan, you know, I, I think that even in our escapism, yeah, all that real reality is still there. It's, yeah, it's just we're yeah. we're escaping from, but you can never totally escape from. No, it even those at, are your references that you're coming from. Even as a high school kid, I remember I was reading. Uh, I was really into uh, Watership Down, and T. H. White's Once and Future King, which is this thick Arthurian book. That's uh, kind of his sort of idea of uh, Mallory's uh, Death of Arthur, and uh, which was a sort of the the earlier classic Arthurian uh, story. And um, even in that story of, of King Arthur, with all the cool stuff that's going on, he marries, a, he has a queen who's unfaithful to him. He has a best friend who, who cuckolds him. And that's harsh. 
And that is such a downer for me. Yeah. You know, yeah, but me it's, too. Uh, me too. It's That's really hard for me to accept. Yeah. So I kind of tend to want to go with like when Arthur was young and he's hanging out with Merlin and the owl and you know all this cra- and all the Mer- the Merlin stuff is such a great foil to like the heavier stuff, you know, because Merlin's such a great character in those books, you know, and he's fascinating. But that whole stuff, I get swept up in that. But the Guinevere Lancelot uh, triangle, or the yeah. fact that he has to go to battle with his own son at right. the end of the Order. story. Order. That's heavy stuff. Yeah. And it, it just reminds us that we have heavy stuff that we have to overcome too. But that's why it endured, the story endures. And that's why the Greek myths and the, and the yeah. tragedies and all that stuff with Zeus and, and everybody, it endures yeah. because it's got that side that you don't yeah. want, but that it's real. That we've all got you know, experiences in our lives that we don't like happen, but... Yeah, and morally conflicting say. characters like Zeus and Odin and yeah. a lot of the gods yeah. are very... Uh, Right, Sometimes right. they're hard to and, like, and, you know. Yeah, and Lancelot and Guinevere. Oh yeah. Know? yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. So that's I think that's why the mythologies endure, and whatever the modern mythologies are, with you know the X Men and uh, and who Spider Man, whoever's the one who's popular today. Yeah, they've got to be tapping into something, or all those people wouldn't be standing in line to see it. I mean, I'm not yeah. necessarily standing in line to see it, but right. I'm kind of an outsider and always have been, so that's okay. But they're hitting on something. And yeah. a great songwriter that I'm really into, since I'm really into music, Steve Earle, told a songwriting workshop, "We're in the empathy business." Mm. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah which is really I like that. It's true. Provoking. Thank you, Steve that's Earle. Tr- yeah. <laughs> is, there a, is there a story you guys created that you're like, you know what, this is, this is the greatest thing, and you did it for personal gain rather than financial gain, and, you're, and it, just didn't, it just didn't, you know, blow up. It didn't, it didn't you know, explode. Right. I just never did anything thinking... This is going to make a lot of money. I know there's comic book artists that, I'll tell you a little story. I know it's not, you know, it's third person, but there's a story going back to uh, the Marvel days of, I want to say, the early 90s or late 80s. And supposedly some comic book artists were st- sitting around talking about why, what they wanted to do with comics. And Use the mic more. I don't know if he's... One, one, artist, one artist said, uh, you know, I want, to, I want to work on the characters that I, I loved when I was a kid and that inspired me to want to do comics. And one of them said, I want to tell, you know, great stories. And the other one said, I want to create a character that's so famous and popular that I become rich. That was Todd McFarlane, by the way. Um, and... Uh, it worked. I can't remember who the other two guys... It worked. But I couldn't do that. No. You know, I... And I remember seeing Spawn going, this looks like somebody came up with something that's like taking from like the smorgasbord and putting on a plate and this looks like it could work and, and it did, you know. I, I've always done what you describe. I've never done something because I thought it would no. be commercial. I've yeah. always drawn what I, because I put so much time and sweat and research into my drawings. It's got to be something I really want to do. You need to be and passionate about it. If I a script it. I don't like, I'll try and figure out what part of it I could draw that will make it interesting, like, you know. Like if if it's set in an interesting place, I'll I'll do a lot of long shots so I get to draw the landscapes, even if I don't like the characters or what they're doing, you know. Yeah. Figure out a way to. Make I just it. I had this burning desire to do a comic that was just back in the early '90s, a, a comic that encapsulated some of the things I was really interested in, not so much in comics, but in uh, in my life and in fiction and crime fiction. Uh, sort of cosmic horror, like Lovecraftian horror, gothic horror, and just the fact that I love Halloween. And these things kind of rolled together into a story for me. And it really started with just coming up with this character and then populating his world with different people and what would be fun to draw and what would be a fun um, situation. And that laid the groundwork for doing Nocturnals. But then later on, the relationships started to coalesce, and that's the stuff that keeps me going back. You know what? Where where am I? T- where can I take them next? Where are they going? You know, I, the the main character is started out as is the father character, and now it's the daughter. It really is her story, and I want to see what I want to see her come out okay. So I just keep going back, you know, to that. Have, have you done stuff, Steve? That was okay. This is going to be my big shot at the big <laughs> time, and uh... um, <clears throat> not really. I've always been lucky enough to work on projects that I really like. Um, I've, 
I've only rarely taken on anything just for the money. I won't say what those were, but generally I've been lucky in, in, in working on projects that uh, I liked. I mean, I started mm -hmm. out working at Marvel on Warlock and Howard the Duck, which <laughs> at that point in time were my two favorite mm. uh, books at Marvel. So I, That's I great. consider myself extremely wow. lucky. Yeah. Wow. Um, and then the next book I got onto was Star Wars, mm -hmm. um, the, wow. the, the movie adaptation. Great stuff, so yeah. it just, you know, I, I was very fortunate in right. my own particular timing. Um, and after that, I just worked on, on things that I actually liked. I drew Spider Woman for a while and uh, eventually at DC working on uh, Fables and just. Yeah, that sounds good. And I imagine, yeah. Trina, you're kind of similar. Right. Um, you just do what. You, was there a point? Well, like maybe you're maybe you're writing Wonder Woman. You thought would be a big hit or something. Or no, I didn't do it because it was going to be a big hit. I did. I the Wonder Woman four part series I did back in the eighties um, was my homage to Harry G. Peter. Really, you know, I tried to draw it in his style. I worked mm -hmm. with a big stack of Golden mm -hmm. Age Wonder Woman comics yeah, right. next to me. Drawings, yeah. um, I don't. I think he's he's been very underappreciated. I, I love, I his, love his yeah. art. Yeah, it's great. Um, but things that I've written myself, uh, I'm th I think of Go Girl, which it's mm -hmm. just really tragic that it didn't it didn't make it, and it didn't make it because we were doing it in the in the early twentieth century, mm -hmm. when the whole thing. I mean, I'm talking about like. 2005, those early years, it was all the bad girl comics, those horrible, horrible, yeah, you right. know, and, and that was all you saw, yeah. and they did Early it in the 90s. comic stores, you know, and that was the <clears throat> only place that you could sell your comics was in comic stores, yeah. which is still a ridiculous idea, know. you know, um, and, and they didn't want to carry anything for girls, yeah, you know. Right. I really loved Go Girl, and I loved I loved the villains in Go Girl mm -hmm. almost more than the than the main characters, right? Um, and the concept that she has her mother was a superheroine, a flying superheroine, and she has inherited her mother's ability to fly. You know, that's all. You know, no nothing fancy yeah, and right. scientific about right. it. You know, yeah, no, but that's good. no cosmic that's good. rays nice, or anything. And, yeah, and good. yeah. Um, but the comic book stores didn't want anything that had anything to do with girls or women. No. You know, they yeah. were horrible. <laughs> so they would maybe like order two copies. And then when they sold them, they'd go, phew, got rid of those. <laughs> and never reorder. And never reorder, yeah. You know? and That's generally how they are. You know, during the, the, the 80s also, of course, when I was working on first Misty and then California Girls, it was the same thing. It was my desperate attempt yeah, to bring those. back for comics Eclipse for girls. Eclipse, do, Eclipse did yeah. California Girls. Right. Marvel did Misty. Mm. And I, you cannot imagine how much fan mail I got from little girls. Yeah. I mean, it filled cartons, mm -hmm. which I eventually donated to the Billy Ireland Library. Mm -hmm. um, I, and, and they they would all say, "I love Misty" or "I love California Girls," but I can never find it yeah. because those damn comic book yeah. stores wouldn't carry totally it. Totally sexist era, yeah. It's frustrating, yeah. I, I that's when I was so alienated by the industry it, then, you know. And I. Well, guys, we are out of time, but I want to thank you for uh, being on this panel. And obviously, uh, if you want to go see these guys, they are out. Thank you guys for uh, doing this this afternoon. Thank you for having Thank us. You.